logging in um, to uh, to join our webinar this morning. Bear with me one second. I see uh, Michael's already here, uh, Melanie, and uh, Nick, Logan. Welcome, everybody. Our speakers are ready as well. They're on standby. We're looking forward to the presentation today. Wonderful. I have uh, over 100 registrants today. Uh, very exciting. Obviously a very timely topic. And uh, we're going to go ahead and begin with the uh, webinar at this point. Um, I still see people logging in, so please join. Looking forward. Good morning from Washington, D.C. This is Omar Owais, uh, Germany Trade and Invest. Oh, pardon me. Let me just give it to you full screen here. One second. All right. Here we go. Um, today's focus of the webinar is apps and other mobile health solutions uh, with a focus on the German healthcare market. I'm Omar Oweis, Director of Investor Consulting at uh, Germany Trade and Invest in Washington, D.C., and we have folks dialed in from India, Egypt, the U.S., Europe. It's wonderful, so thank you for joining us. Real quick, for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with uh, Germany Trade and Invest yet, um, we're the Economic Development Agency for Germany. In a nutshell, we help international companies establish their business operations in Germany. We do so by providing various uh, services. Um, so on one hand, we obviously market Germany uh, internationally as a business and technology location in order to, to create and secure jobs. We um, promote all of Germany as well as some of the special incentives in some of the new federal states, such as Berlin and some of the former East states. We uh, provide uh, export market information for the German economy that can be companies or associations. And we also have uh, business location consultancy services. These look, uh, these look like this. Um, it can be um, specific market and industry reports, as well as uh, strategies about market entry. We have uh, tax and legal information, funding and financing information and opportunities. We can connect you with the correct partners in Germany and offer site selection uh, for your project in Germany. Again, our publications and our services are free of charge. We are funded by the German government. Real quick to our Succeed in Germany's Healthcare Market series. I know this is a bit of a loaded page, but let me just draw your attention to the top portion, 2016. This is the second of three this year. Uh, we've looked at market access and regulatory update, uh, the ongoing revision in the European Union. Today, obviously, mobile health solutions. And we do have one more coming up, biopharmaceuticals, looking at R&D production and, of course, market access. A couple highlights real quick. Um, our series is three years old. Um, we've looked at other funding options in the past, the over-the-counter market, the hospital market, digital healthcare as well, as well as the uh, demographic challenges and the aging society in Germany. Let's get the show on the road. We have three outstanding speakers lined up for you, all coming to you from Berlin today. Ms. Julia Rühle from our Germany Trade Invest headquarters, Mr. Volker Amelung from Berlin as well, from the German Managed Care Association, as well as Ms. Larissa Middendorf, a testimonial of a company, Welldo, GmbH, uh, that is uh, successful in the German market. You can post your questions using your chat feature and your toolbar on the right-hand side. Basic format, we're just going to let the speakers get through their presentations each. You can post questions at any time. You will not interrupt the speakers. I will gather those questions and present them in an open Q&A form at the very end. Our first speaker, as I said, is Ms. Julia Rühle from Germany Trade and Invest from the headquarters in Berlin, and her presentation is on mobile solutions um, for the German healthcare system. Julia, I will hand over the rights to you at this point. Thank you, Omar. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar today. And I will now go ahead and uh, show you my presentation on mobile solutions for Germany's healthcare system. So, let's start with a quick overview. What are we talking about? We talk about medical and public health practice supported by mobile devices such as mobile phones, patient monitoring devices, or PDAs, and other wireless devices. As you know, um, mobile health or mHealth can be applied in all of the areas of the healthcare system. Um, they range from yeah, simple wellness and fitness applications to complex programs used for diagnostics or therapy management. 
you're probably also familiar with the buzzwords surrounding the concept of mHealth. So mobile health solutions support us in leading healthier lives, but they can also help us monitor, monitor our vital signs when we're sick. They help us to manage um, our medication intake and so empower us as patients or customers to keep an eye on our, on our health. What is really important, of course, is not to see the areas detached from each other, but to see mHealth as a holistic um, system. Mobile health, mHealth solutions can provide, can improve the healthcare, the healthcare system. Um, it can close gaps in healthcare provision, and it can also help making healthcare more efficient. So, why do we need mHealth in Germany? First of all, uh, Germany's healthcare expenditure um, is constantly rising, as you can see here. Um, they already exceeded the 300 billion euro mark. One reason for that is, of course, the medical and technical advancement. But uh, we have also quite some challenge, challenge, challenging um, yeah, developments in, in Germany that we are facing right now. As you might know, we are an aging society. We are the oldest population in Europe and the second oldest population in the world after Japan. Of course, with that, other challenges come along. The number of care-dependent uh, people in Germany is rising and also the number of patients with chronic diseases or with multiple diseases at the same time. So, where do we stand with mHealth in Germany? This forecast, um, this forecast shows you that the mHealth market is projected to grow to 3 billion euro in 2017. Um, this, is, this is just the forecast um, and it is said that um, it, is, it, it has enormous growth potential of, two, of 22 percent um, actually and this um, 3 billion euro is projected for this, um, this current scenario. What does it look like? Well, the current scenario is that mHealth has already um, great acceptance on the consumer level. 31% of Germans use uh, fitness trackers to monitor their vital signs. This is according to a poll by Bitkom, the IT Industry Association of Germany. 30% of Germans um, of, of Germany smartphone users install health apps. Germans are really health conscious uh, and they are willing to pay or to invest on their personal health on top of their monthly insurance contribution. So what is the problem? Well, of course, mHealth goes beyond fitness and wellness functions, right? Apps can be classified as medical devices. They can be prescribed by doctors. Um, and there are multiple examples of companies in Germany that have made that, that you know, have been successful in doing that and that have developed mobile solutions for patients to support their therapy or to manage their chronic diseases. One hurdle of the integration of mHealth into this primary or professional healthcare field is the strict regulation of the German healthcare market. Adjust adjustments to the legal framework, including data protection issues, um, can result to a further boost um, of the mHealth market so that the market could be advanced up to 4.2 billion euro. Um, of course, we always have to be careful with uh, market projections like this um, and we should, you know, of course, see those as forecasts, but I think that we all agree that the market is really dynamic, a really promising market, and the strict regulation in Germany also creates a really safe mHealth environment. In fact, investors and professionals um, are more optimistic. Um, there is a growing startup scene in Germany that really drives the mHealth market. We see more and more startups that um, cooperate with with health insurance companies that have corporations with large, already well-established companies in Germany. And in the next presentations, you will see how to um, access the quite complex 
healthcare market in Germany, and you will also see examples of how how that works in, in Germany. So with that, I leave you with my contact information, and I hand over back to Omar. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was very informative, and for that overview of the uh, M uh, health market in Germany. Switch over here. Bear with me one second. Great. Our next speaker, um, Mr. Volker Amelung, CEO at the German Managed Care Association in Berlin as well, will, as Julia pointed out, give us uh, information about how to get access to the German healthcare market. Volker, I will send over the rights to you at this point. Bear with me. So, could you see my screen now? Yes, and I hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Omar. Um, Hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure being with you today. And I, I just want to talk a little bit uh, more in detail, in a sense, on the question how to get money out of a German healthcare system. Julia mentioned um, very thoroughly, in a sense, the rationale why we need these kind of uh, M-Health approaches, why the German market would make a lot of sense. But at the end of the day, a market just makes sense when you're able to access the market and if you're able to get money out of a healthcare system. There are a couple of different ways to enter into the German healthcare system. And first of all, when you think about uh, all kind of products, we are separating between a first healthcare market. That's the one which is paid by the insurance companies. That's the one where everybody who's insured in Germany uh, in the steroid sickness funds uh, have access to, and there's a second healthcare market. That's what uh, also Julia mentioned in the sense that people are paying out of pocket uh, for, uh, on their own for, for other products. When you look at the size of the contracts, you see the collective reimbursement. That's the huge market. That's where hospitals are paid for, ambulatory care is paid for. That's in a sense where, in a sense, the volume is in the German healthcare market. And that's something which is very fundamental whenever you want to have a larger success of being reimbursed, the goal must to be how do we get access to the collective reimbursement? And in in principle, if you would ask people in Germany, we'll always say everything what is really needed for healthcare, what really makes sense, has to be in the collective reimbursement, has to be accessible for every citizen, completely independent, how much money he earns, what is what are his preferences, but that's in a sense what's for everybody. Secondly, insurance companies could sign select contract with different with different players. That could be, for example, producers of an app, that could be physician organizations, and within these kind of selective contracting, they could, in a sense, define whatever whatever kind of uh, health product they, wa they want to have. But when you look at the volume, it is a much smaller volume. Secondly, the, uh, the sickness funds could uh, design voluntary sickness fund services, in a sense, to a very small degree, insurance companies could differentiate each other and saying, one is paying a little bit more for alternative medicine than others. And we have a public innovation fund, which is just established this year, where 300 million annually just for innovative products, uh, which is pretty interesting, especially for, for E&M Health. There was a specific call just on telemedicine, where they were just looking, in a sense, for E&M Health solution. <coughs> Sorry. And there's a second health market uh, where People could, in a sense, buy whatever they want, which is a 76 billion billion market. If we dig a little bit more into detail and look into the different ways how you could access the market, you see, for example, for ambulatory care, the market size was 35 billion, which is a pretty huge, huge market. You have a collective a positive vote as market access. So, in a sense, we differentiate between hospitals and ambulatory care that in a sense in ambulatory care something has to be allowed, whereas in hospital it has to be forbidden. So in a sense, where everything which is which is not allowed could not be go into ambulatory care, and the hospital is exactly the opposite. We still reimburse in ambulatory care before service, but it's pretty heavily capped. Hospital services we um, we finance through DRGs, and it's certainly, for example, if you think about uh, uh, eHealth or mHealth solution, uh, hospitals could, in a sense, buy uh, on their own parts from an mHealth um, component and put it into their DRG. 
Then we have the Medical Aids uh, catalog, um, where Cygnus funds collectively positive vote, and where you have um, fee per device negotiated with each Cygnus fund. And I don't want to go too much into the details uh, of the other ones, but what is important that you have completely different market accesses, and you see you have very different ways of reimbursement. So that's one side, in a sense, and that's what is very typical for the for the German healthcare system, that in a sense you have it's heavily regulated. There's very little leeway. There's very little difference between uh, insurance company A or B. It is collectively organized. It's a very strictly regulated healthcare system. That's one. <coughs> Sorry. Secondly. What is important, and that's something, especially we're talking to an international audience, it's very important to look at it, is the time to market. Whenever you want to go to be, in a sense, paid an ambulatory um, fee catalog, you should calculate at least two years, in a sense, from the first step trying entering into the market, being paid, in a sense, as part of um, the collective um, uh, the, the collective services uh, accessible for everybody. Same with hospitals, with medical aid catalog, it's also pretty much the same. The same also with, uh, with selective contracts. Normally you calculate one to two years on average time for being able to sign such kind of contracts. So we see a lot of international companies entering into the German market and thinking, well, we, we look three months, we negotiate three months, and after six months we could do business. This is a completely wrong approach uh, <coughs> to access to the German market. It is a very exciting, but also very slow market. I will come back to that later. And you say, see the same thing for innovative uh, public innovation funding and the voluntary services. Just, just very briefly, just very briefly, how the process is, and just to get an idea how much these kind of things are standardized in the German healthcare system. When you look at the pathway to ambulatory care reimbursement, there's one thing which is very important. You see, in the sense, you have a working committee of evaluation, then you have an evaluation committee, and then you see the National Association of uh, Steroid Health Insurance Physicians and the Steroid Health Insurances themselves. What is important in this graph is just the understanding that whenever you come with a disruptive innovation, you have to go, in a sense, through a decision-making process old, uh, out of the old players. And that makes it very, very hard for really innovative approaches because, in a sense, we want to decide whether you could be, be reimbursed are the ones who, in a sense, providing the old system or, in a sense, providing the old kind of services. Uh, and that's what we call self-governing system where, in a sense, the, the actors themselves make the rules. This is very hard for somebody who's doing something completely new or something very disruptive. It will be very hard to access into the market. Secondly, <coughs> sorry. Uh, secondly, while looking at hospital care reimbursement, we have a, a different approach. In hospital care, in a sense, whenever you want to have innovation, you have to apply for an individual permission to do it. And again, it is going, in a sense, through a very systematic approach up till you get the permission. And then it could be reimbursed according, in a sense, uh, on the account of the different payers. While, while looking at uh, mobile solution, one thing is important to have a quick look at. This is the approval of medical devices, uh, which in Germany is based on risk class. So in a sense, you have risk class one, lowest risk classification. That's like reading glasses, thermometers, or wheelchairs. There, the access is incredibly easy. We are uh, focusing much more on the class 2B and 3. 3 is very, very clear, too. It's like hip, hip implants, brass implants, and drug eluting stands. Out of quite a lot of uh, scandals we had over the last years, people are trying to get, in a sense, the uh, access more difficult to have, uh, in a sense, higher hurdles to get the products into the market, but also the same with uh, type 2Bs. Where we have a lot of discussion in the German healthcare system is about, in a sense, some kind of mobile solutions where people give concrete therapy uh, suggestions. And then it's the question whether you should place it to A, 1, or even 3B. And um, 
this makes it very different whether you get access to reimbursement from insurance companies, but also to market. Just quickly to summarize, what is in a sense when when you when you think about accessing the German healthcare market, there are, it's it's a great market. It's no question. It's a huge market. It's maybe one of a very very few market where the strongest problem in the German healthcare system is. There's no financial pressure on the German healthcare system. There's a huge amount of money in the German healthcare system. We even had over years now the situation that we had more money in the health insurance system we need for providing health care. So there's there's no pressure, there's no transparency, there are uh, massive monopolistic, uh, monopolistic situation. And while looking what are in a sense the things where you have to keep in mind while thinking about entering the German market, it's very heavily evidence driven. If you want to enter with a mobile solution and you could not provide study results, and in a sense to have the proof, it does not need to be a randomized controlled trial, it does not meet the, the level of a gold standard study comparable to pharmaceuticals, but it has to be data driven. You need to have evidence. The German market is very slow. Don't esteem that you could enter the market in six months, it is more a question of 18 months, it takes time. It's a risk adverse mass market, it's a very much partnership driven market, so it's never in a sense the one who do it on his own, it is in a sense you for example as a provider for an M health solution has to work together with a physician network, with a hospital and an insurance company, so always bringing people together. One of the problems is the German healthcare system is very much German speaking. It's very hard in a sense to enter the market. Uh, for example, if you present English slide, that makes it very diff difficult. And it is, and that makes it sometimes difficult to enter. It's an old boys network driven, um, which is not the most in innovative uh, uh, environment. But at the end of the day, exciting market, but it has some specific situations. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Volker. Thank you so much as well. I'm going to leave your slide up just for a second for the, your your contact information. Uh, every time I listen to you speak, I, I, I learn something new. It's no wonder you used to lecture at uh, at Columbia University. So thanks again for your presentation. Real quick, I want to just uh, point out I have already received a few questions from from some of the audience members. Uh, keep them coming. Um, I'm collecting them, and I will present them at the very end in the Q and A. We have one more speaker. And I just wanted to highlight the URL at the bottom of each of my slides, uh, gtai.com forward slash succeed in German healthcare. This uh, will take you to our webinar landing page where you have uh, the bios where you'll have of, of the speakers, you'll have the presentations, um, and you'll eventually find a recording of this webinar as well. Without further ado, last but not least, uh, we actually have a testimonial from a company from WellDo GmbH given by Ms. Larissa Middendorf, uh, also out of Berlin. Um, her focus, of course, is how WellDo is uh, succeeding, has succeeded, and is succeeding in the German healthcare market. And we look forward to this testimonial as well. Larissa, rights coming over to you right now. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Mar, and hello out to everyone listening. I'm Larissa. I work as a manager in business development at Weldo, and for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about digital health best practice in Germany. Weldo is a digital health company, meaning we develop apps and software for the healthcare market, especially online coachings, digital assistance, which help people to live better and be healthier. We are located in Berlin, in the digital health capital, where next to Weldo you can find a lot of healthcare industry, pharmaceutical companies, research and development institutes, and many, many startups. Weldo was founded in 2000, so we are already 16 years old, and at that time we launched 200 digital health applications in 14 different languages. Overall, at our office, we are 60 professionals, and we work in interdisciplinary teams, and there are experts like digital experts, customer and client partners, UX and visual designers, different kinds of developers, and um, one big team that actually makes Walla unique among digital agencies, that's the healthcare team. The healthcare team are people like Dr. Claudia Busch, who's an 
ecotrophologists or professionals like Frederica Escher, who's in, specialized in obesity, psychologists, then there are physiotherapists who actually worked in that field for a long time and are responsible for our concepts. And at least there are, um, there are dieti um, dietitians who organize, for example, a food database with specialized recipes for different types and diseases. The bottom line of this is that well, there's a very specific, specific approach in creating and developing digital services. Our apps are based on scientific knowledge from the area you just saw, like psychology, nutrition science, sports science, and medicine. And it's important for us that uh, we deliver a measurable effectiveness with our services. There was a little bit of who we are, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we actually do. There are a lot of diseases related to nutrition and inactivity. In this chart, you can see a number of Americans with um, diet and inactivity-related diseases, such as overweight, which are more than, 100, uh, um, than 130 million affected persons, and other diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary heart diseases, osteoporosis, some kind of cancer, and a stroke. Um, so this are current results from the Clinical Nutrition Conference in 2016, and these diseases are just diseases which have more, more or less direct impact, and there are many more that are not caused or like directly by, di by the, your diet or inactivity, but are, that's part of the therapy and the treatment. So it's generally more, the therapy is more than taking medication. It's about behavior change, like understanding and accepting um, the disease, and patients often have no idea what's happening inside their body, and because of that, it's hard for them to behave correctly and behave healthy. They usually need to change their habits as part of the therapy. Um, if it's to stop smoking or be more physically active, and I imagine that all of you have at some point tried to quit or change a habit, and experience that it's quite challenging. So patients actually have to do it often, and they don't have another choice if they want to become healthier. So in order to create a user-friendly digital service, you need to write a program that concerns all aspects of behavior change. Bottom line of this part is that our services are life enhancing. While those digital applications use psychological motivation techniques to bring about sustainable improvements in health-related behavior and, as a result, quality of life. They provide every user with access to the latest scientific knowledge. There's one more thing that is important for our digital services, and that is our focus rests on products with few core features and with a sharp use case. That's actually called a minimum lovable product, or an MLP. And the MLP means not to make a long list of features, features you, can, um, you can use and you want in your app and think you use might want them too, but to actually select a few core features to start with, which make the app functional, reliable, usable, and brings an emotion and connection to the app. That brings me to my last bottom line of things that are important for digital health services. It's being empathetic. Other uses service design methods to understand the needs and everyday reality of our various user groups. And this allows us to develop powerful solutions that provide effective day-to-day -day support. And now, finally, I will show you a few best practice examples of apps and services we did so far. At first, this is an app called Husteblume. It's an app from one of Germany's largest insurance companies, Technica Krankenkassen. It's an app that assists people suffering from allergies. It gives daily advice on how bad the pollen count of a specific plant or tree will be in your area, so you can better decide if you should take your medication or not. For the user, it's pretty simple. It's a simple app which just needs you to track your symptoms for about a week and then gives you your personal pollen forecast every day. And the back end, it's a little bit more complex because it's like a big data project that includes a lot of data from weather reports and 
um, weather forecast and was created with the collabor um, as a collaboration with the University Hospital Charity and the University of Vienna. The second example is also a project from the insurance company Technica Krankenhausen. It's a diabetes diary app. It helps uh, the patient to organize their disease because for people with diabetes it is important to know what they are eating or what they ate and how that influences the blood sugar. The app tracks blood sugar and medication and it can even be linked to the glucose monitors. Uh, as a mobile app it's pretty handy for the patient because they always have it in their pocket and for the insurance company it uh, decreases consecutive symptoms caused by wrong behavior. My next example is the Boyera Body Shape app, which is a fitness and nutrition app with an easy food tracking system. Because food tracking is usually the most difficult one out of the tracking systems because you just need to do it manually. So it's a huge dropout potential, so we made it easier. The users don't need to track everything they ate, just the things they are supposed to eat, just the good things like did they eat enough vegetables or fruits and they don't have to track every single item. They can um, track and measure in portions like one handful of fruits. Tracking is easier for sleep and activity because you can track that automatically with your smartphone or in this case with a fitness tracker or in case of weight and body fat users can even connect a scale. The last example for today is the app Rheuma Outside. It's an app offered by the German Rheumatism League. It's a self-management app that helps with audio instructions against rheumatic pain. And if the, um, if the patient is in a car or maybe a plane, the app offers special exercises for a sitting position to um, relieve the pain in this sitting position. This is basically how well this succeeds in the healthcare market by developing empathetic, scientific and life enhancing apps that fulfill the needs of the users and by being creative and innovative within the rules of the German healthcare system. It's not about reinventing the system, it's about supporting patients and adapt to a changing society. So if you are interested in digital health services and working with all of my contact information, and at least I hope I could inspire you to use an app and live a healthy life. So thank you. Well, we have to say thank you, Larissa. That was really informative, and those apps look really neat. Switch over here right now. Wonderful. All right. So thank you for those questions as well. I am collecting them. I see them coming in very actively. This is great. Um, feel free to use that toolbar. Um, at this point, we are done with the presentations. And we're going to get right into the open Q&A forum, so uh, all speakers go ahead and uh, be ready to answer uh, as I uh, um, administer the, the questions. Here's a question actually for Weldu. Um, you're using scientific data in your apps. Are you required or are they required to be done using studies in Germany or are foreign studies accepted as well? Mm, that actually depends on the company we're working for, but in general we can accept um, all kinds of studies, even if they are from foreign countries, but it's important if we do an app that's for the German market, then usually the companies want studies that are actually made into German market, so they know it's um, specialized for their patients or customers. Actually, a follow-up question here. Um, where do you see best results in sales, direct to end user consumers, or reimbursed apps purchased by the insurance companies or hospitals? Well, that's an interesting question, but um, <laughs> we actually don't sell the, our apps ourselves. We don't do really the, the, the customer side of it. We just work for the company and they manage the whole, um, whole sales of the apps and uh, the marketing pro progress. So for us, um, it's not a big difference, but since we are so scientific, it's usually for us important that we sell them for uh, to insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and not, not for sales or marketing. Wonderful. Thank you. 
here's a Brexit question. <laughs> Why not? We'll throw it out there. How will Brexit affect the ability to gain access to the German healthcare market from the UK? Um, what typical methods are needed to be accepted for insurance um, in Germany as an app developer from the UK? Two-part question there. Anybody would like to take a stab at that? Tough question. <laughs> we'll start with the first part again. I will, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Volker. I think well, definitely Brexit will will affect uh, everybody doing business from the UK. You will be considered as somebody not being part of um, uh, the, the, the core freedoms, um, which is goods, uh, personal capital, etc. So, in a sense, uh, yes, I would expect it will have um, serious effects on on, uh, on UK developers. Thank you. Another question here. Um, someone noticed a lot of German on the apps of uh, of WellDo. Um, how important is the German language, uh, or is an English version enough? No, it's very important that the apps uh, apps are in German. If you want to sell to insurance companies or pharmaceutical or the patients, they actually require the German language and. If you have an English app, they usually get translated. Great, thank you. Um, a lot of questions for WellDo. <laughs> Larissa, we're going to keep you on the mic for a second. Um, do the WellDo apps have clinically relevant outcomes connected to their apps? Well, yes, a few of them, but not all of them. That um, we I didn't show you there, but there's actually an app for de depression and. Um, we did a study on that where actually is clinical outcome, but if it's an app like for fitness or in the prevention sector, we usually don't measure that much. But if you want to get a reimbursed by the insurance companies without evidence, uh, it's hopeless. Great. Another question um, uh, for the operating systems: um, Is it iOS or Android or Windows Phone, or are the apps uh, available to be worked? To, can they work on all uh, operating systems on smartphones? Well, probably not on all, but um, all of our apps, at least for Android and iOS, some of them are even uh, programmed for Windows Phone, and some of them have a web version so that you can log in through your browser. Great, thank you. Um, another question here for WellDo. Um, how do you make sure, or how can somebody make sure that patients do not lose interest in using a medical app? That's a challenge well, really can. for the whole industry. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You can't really make sure that um, they that you lose them, but um, usually our approach is to actually um, consider what a patient, what the patient journey is, so we can you can be part of the patient journey and um, try to keep them interested in this different states of the journey. And as I said, there are um, psychologists working. At Waldo, and they focus on motivation and how people actually use the app and um, how we keep them interested. So yeah, but we don't have the big, big idea how to do that. It's challenging for us, but um, we are actually quite good. <laughs> I have a question. Thank you, Larissa. I have a question here from a company saying that they have designed a medical, a smartphone app um, which connects to a cloud machine and monitors the patients. Um, in Germany, would we would they need to get approval from an authority? Maybe a question for Volker. Maybe the way that. Uh, it, it depends. It depends. That's what I put in the slide. In the sense um, where do you differentiate uh, the, the classes, the risk classes, and um, but in principle, um, at least to my knowledge, it is not that you have or that a cloud solution is in a sense considered differently than another. Um, storage solution, but you have to keep in mind that there are quite a lot of people, especially on the insurance side, who would feel pretty uncomfortable with a, with a cloud solution. Thank you, Volker. French National Syndicate uh, from William um, for Medical Technologies. Uh, do we have, we or any of the speakers, do we have figures, rates about the number of mHealth applications 
patients which have a CE mark or a medical device status. Maybe a question for Julia, um, some of the information that we have that we can supply. Um, I don't I don't have it um, at hand, but I know that there are um, multiple sources in Germany that try to track um, not only the different companies that are coming up and the different solutions, but also those who have um, CE mark or who have um, um, you know who yeah who have different special uh, specialities. Um, I don't know if there's a study out that shows that right you know right now but um, I think we can we can find data on this definitely I don't know if, if, yeah. if it will be you know um, um, yeah if, if you can track all of them but I, I can think we can we can provide more information on that I would just encourage you could, you could, have a look at the, yeah, you could look at the charisma study which was published uh, two months ago and I'm not quite sure if the, the English version there should be at least in English short version but I don't know if it's yet out but in the Charisma study, there are these kind of figures. Great. Thank you, Volker. Um, William, we'll be able to follow up with you also post the webinar. We have your contact information. Sure. Um, another question here, um, how do you see the challenges in legislation for data sharing between users and providers? Great question. Anybody want to uh, the, the, the legal situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the legal situation is uh, the, the user, in a sense, the, the patient has to, um, to sign to accept that data are shared with providers. But as soon as he sign uh, his his acceptance, then it's pretty fine. That's what you could have, for example, in any kind of selective contracting, where it's mandatory that the patient is really signing into the program and they say, I want to be part of this program, and within this program, this and that data will be shared between different providers. That's perfectly fine. Great. Thank you. Another question. Do you need to register a company in Germany to sell an app? That's a question for me then, I guess. Um, well, the answer is um, if you want to be successful in, in Germany and especially in the healthcare, in the healthcare market, it is um, quite important to have, you know, a German speaking um, representative here in Germany. Um, if, if it helps a lot if you have a German address and if your customers whether they um, order something online or you know they they buy something somewhere else that they have a German address that they can you know feel safe about what they're buying that they have the German information but also somebody that speaks German to them and can explain the the product or the solution or can explain um, you know other processes um, um, relating to to buying those uh, the, the product so it makes a lot of sense to um, you know have somebody on the ground have your office here and um, not to forget that um, Germany is really central in, in Europe and the biggest market in Europe so from here you can um, access all the other uh, European markets so it makes a lot of sense it's not you know we it's not like you have to but it definitely makes it easier to sell here in Germany to have an office here yeah or, or you have the business model where you exactly want to have the opposite for example doctor ad where you would like uh, in a sense to have a, a teledoctor which is forbidden in Germany and then you have to do the business from outside Germany so there are a couple of cases where, in a sense, German legislation forbids some kind of medical treatment, which might make sense, which is common, for example, in Switzerland or other countries. Then it might make sense, but otherwise it's exactly what Julia said. Great. Thank you to both of you. A question here. Um, which clinics uh, are interested to use digital health uh, data, private or public? And do they have independent resources to pay for it? Maybe Volker, kind of a specific question. I was scared yeah, that you give me the question. Well, sure. we, have, we, have, we have a couple of very strong private uh, hospital chains, which are very open for uh, for M Health solutions, who even have their own accelerators like like Helios. Um, private hospitals are definitely the better place for for M Health solutions. Nevertheless, all of the hospitals are 
not that open to share, in a sense, their DRGs with other providers. We, we did some studies and tried, in a sense, to get, uh, could, we, could we motivate hospitals, in a sense, to pay somebody to reduce the length of stay by using technology? Pretty hard to enter into the market. And governmental hospitals, and especially university hospitals, are pretty short of money. Great, thank you. Here's a question um, about the initial pathway to gain insurance acceptance in Germany. Will this make an app easily visible to individuals? So I guess the procedure of gaining insurance acceptance. Maybe Julia or Volker, or maybe even Weldu, <laughs> Larissa. Volker, do you have an answer for that? I think you showed. Um something on, on your slides already, if I, if I got the yeah. question right. I didn't understand the question probably. Uh, Omar, could you please repeat Sure, no, nope, absolutely, no, no problem. What is the initial pathway to gain insurance acceptance? And will this make an app easily visible to individuals? Um, well, it's, it's pretty much all the insurances are getting contacted by uh, representatives from, uh, from app developers. They're, they're going there, they're demonstrating it. Then the insurance company they could decide on their own depending on different legal pathways how they want to put it. But for example, what uh, what Larissa mentioned when the, the TK decides whether they want to have who's the bloom or not, that, that's the decision of TK and you have to convince these people that they should offer to their insured uh, this kind of solution. And this depends very much what kind of insurance talk to the large insurance companies like EK, Barmer, etc. You're talking about 10% of the market with one insurance company. Thank you, Volker. Another question here. Uh, legally, can the personal health data from a German person be hosted outside of Germany or the European Union? That's a good question. The personal health data from a German person can it be hosted outside of Germany or the EU? Well, Larissa, yeah. Volker. From my experience, yeah. From my experience, sure. um, no, it can't because there are the German data protection laws who actually say that healthcare data are very important data and that they need to be stored inside of Germany. That's at least. Um, what we always do for our data, and that's what the insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies want. That's a certain Germany because then our data protection law protects those data. It's a, it's a little bit a nasty question because we're, we're so much behind other countries concerning an electronic patient record. We don't have an electronic patient record. So nobody, uh, you, you could not store it outside uh, Germany because we don't have it. Uh, so that's way, one way to look at it. But in principle, uh, you, you, will never, you will never convince an insurance company in Germany when data is stored outside. But that will always be just part of data, for example, for one disease tracking or, or, um, or uh, so, something else. If it's done on, on your own, if somebody is, for example, using Apple's um, health kit or um, uh, the, the health from, from in the iPhone, uh, what you do with your data, you, you could, your health data, you could do whatever you want. Great, thank you. Um, question here for Weldu. Um, how long does it take uh, from an idea of an app to its actual launch on average, or what have been your experiences? That's pretty different um, regarding the app or the, the service you're trying to launch. If it's an easy app like the, the rheumatism app I showed you, that was done in three months. So that was pretty fast, but there are projects that take up to two years because they are so complex and um, they need a lot of, lot of um, conceptual work in the beginning and then there are um, problems with the company on, the, on both sides so that we get everything connected. So yeah, it can be done in three months and can take two, up to two years to launch. But well, it's more if you want to have something like it's usual, it's like about six months. That's a realistic, realistic time frame. Time frame. Great. Thank you. 
the question about events or trade shows related to mobile health in Germany. Um, maybe something for Julia. I mean, I know that we, Germany Trade Invest, we attend a lot of these shows. Maybe a question for Julia. Specific connected health or M health shows in Germany. Right. Um, there is uh, one coming up this November, the Medica. I, I think uh, most of you might be familiar with that as, as it is the biggest, um, the biggest trade show in healthcare and um, it has really focused forums um, on health IT but also on connected health and mobile health. It also has um, like um, competitions, app competitions. So this is one this year. Then there is another one um, really focused on health IT. It's called CONHIT, Connecting Health and IT. It's in Berlin and um, it will take place um, in, in April. It's, it takes place every April um, and it also features um, mHealth um, as one topic and um, yeah, Germany Trade and Invest will host again an international lounge. So for all of you that are you know from the international field and want to want to learn about the German and the European market, that's the that's the right place to go. But there are also many more that are more national focused um, around Berlin, especially as you know that is the startup hub of of Germany. But um, these are the ones that are really also focused on the international international field. Thank you, Julia. Interesting question here regarding, um, I'll just read it out, <laughs> trying to summarize it, but um, are there good case studies of a successful mHealth app um, that has an interface for all insurance companies or some insurance companies, or do the apps have to be tailored to individual insurance companies? Can rephrase that again. But basically, you know, to what extent does yeah. the app can the app be tailored to? Can it? Can it? Yeah. Can it, you know, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead um, I don't know if, if there's a case study. Maybe maybe Fokker has has more on that. But I know of cases where um, where apps, for example, can be prescribed by multiple um, health insurance companies. So they are, you know. So the company that develops this app works together with more than one one health insurance company. I know of, of some of the cases. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There's there are a couple of cases. What what we see very often is that insurance companies are not doing these kind of projects on their own, but it is, for example, two or three insurance companies together. Um, but there's not a single app which is paid by all insurance companies, like in a sense, like like a, um, a medical device which is paid by, by everybody. So we're not that far. Actually, we have them only within selective contracting. There are a couple of them, but they all have the problems. Whenever then this in these kind of selective contracting, they do not have a huge number of uh, subscribers. But most what we see mostly are um, apps which are mass tailored for specific uh, insurance companies, uh, like the one which uh, Larissa mentioned for for TK. Great, thank you so much. I think we have time for me for one or two more questions because I, I do want to wrap this up within an hour for the sake of our speakers as well. Um, here's a question: um, If applications don't have a CE mark, is there? Do you have a labelization program or a referential to get a specific label? I guess is there another way around the CE mark across the, the, the apps? Maybe a question for Volker. Not, not yet. But there's an ongoing discussion whether we need something what we call Gütesiegel, like like in a sense a labeling of apps which are proven, but so far it is just on the discussion, but nothing in a sense uh, already in place. But it's, um, it's on the political agenda. Great. And then here's another question actually. Uh, yes, presentations will be available and the webinar is recorded. We will send that around to post-webinar. Um, looks like one more question here. Uh, in high, I'm not so sure what they mean with in high level. In high level, what kind of local funding tools are there um, for the first two years to enter the market phase? We may have to ask, ask for some clarification on that uh, to to the attendee. But I'm throw it out there one more time. Um, what kind of local funding tools are there 
uh, uh, to service the first two years in entering the, the German market. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I if I got this right, but um, I don't know if this is if I mean they're not really local, but uh, more like national or even international. As I said, there's cooperation with um, with uh, large um, healthcare um, healthcare companies in Germany. They have their own um, accelerators, um, for example. Like Bayer has one. Um, they you know help young companies um, with their solutions. And there are many more examples like that. And then there are also um, VC companies um, that specialize on healthcare and uh, digital health. And uh, they all also have experts from from the medical field, doctors, um, special uh, specialists. And so, yeah, they offer the expertise. They they don't offer only you know the money, the um, financial part, but also their expe expertise on the on the field. That's that's what I know about that. Thank you, Julia. Well, folks, at this point, I do want to first and foremost thank uh, thank our, our wonderful speakers. Um, I we definitely answered uh, the majority of questions. There's a few that we'll follow up post uh, webinar. Um, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Uh, you can find all this information uh, on our uh, webinar landing page, which is on my slide right now as well as my contact information. Feel free to follow up with any one of us uh, post-webinar. You'll also get a uh, thank you for participating email with uh, additional information. At this point, uh, thank you to my speakers. Have a wonderful day, and uh, till the next time. Goodbye. <laughs>